go. Heidi, we've been wanting to do this for a very long time. It's so good to finally have you on the show. Yes, thanks for having me. It's fun to be here. And finally, it's been like months in the making. So I know. Really got able to do it. I know. No, it's awesome. It's awesome. I think um, it, it's there's so much there's so much that you and I could talk about and have spoken about because um, this is obviously not our first encounter. Um, yes. I think the best way to do it for everyone just to break it down is um, for you to tell us all a little bit about yourself and your experience, um, yep. and then um, we can kind of have a chat about how you and I met. Cool. Um, so I'm obviously not from Australia. Um, really? People can, <laughs> people can usually tell within like two seconds. Yeah. Um, from LA, born and raised in LA. Moved out here um, this October will be 15 years ago. Um, just thought it would be fun to live overseas, but just did not plan on loving it as much as I did. I was here for about, and I just came to like, just do the overseas thing. And then I um, came was here for maybe like three weeks and i called my mom and was like i don't think i'm coming back and she was like what it's yeah. like three weeks you know like i was living on like a friend like a chick who i had met traveling in europe um living on her floor and um yeah anyway and uh yeah she, my mom was like how could you you don't even have a job like what are you talking about and i was like these people are just amazing like australians <laughs> are like the coolest so i was kind of hooked um and then yeah, so that's sort of my how I ended up here. But um, professionally, um, I started working in mental health in my early 20s. So, God, I'm almost 40. So, um, yeah, started working in mental health in my early 20s. Started in prison. Mm. I was in prison for a little bit. Um, worked in small groups, group facilitating. Um, started That's sort of where I started. And then worked a bit in eating. My mid-20s worked a bit with people in with eating disorders then late 20s was a whole variety anxiety depression and then uh early 30s started working uh in sexual abuse and trauma and that's mm. when i got really interested in trauma so about 10 years ago really into trauma but really i was doing trauma work before right working in totally. prison people in prison are not <laughs> untraumatized like <laughs> probably the most traumatized population we have so yeah, I actually, I've been working in trauma for a long time. I just didn't realize it at the time because yeah. I wasn't informed, you know, in my early 20s. Um, yeah, and then started working in trauma and sexual abuse, uh, sibling sexual abuse and abuse, you know, occurring within families. And that's when I sort of, I feel weird saying I fell in love with trauma, but <laughs> once you find out more about it and how, I know, I know you will agree with this because we've talked about this before, but um, when you start to get into it and you start to learn how the brain works and how the body works and you start to go, Oh my God, we're all traumatized. A and B it's actually not the end of the world. I think I used to think if someone experienced trauma, that's it, you're fucked for life mm. and you're going to have the worst life ever. And then when I started to learn about it, it was like, no, you're, you'll be fine. You can bounce back. People do it all the time. And then when I started working solely in trauma, the stories and the pain and the suffering that I would hear was just, you know, heartbreaking and mind blowing. Mm -hmm. and, and then you would see people who transform through it and bounce back. And then it also made me understand my own trauma and my own pain that I went through in my early twenties. And, you know, people saying things <clears throat> to me like, God, I can't believe you went through all that and you survived all that. And then me understanding, Oh, that's how trauma was in my life. And that's how I got through it. And I'm okay. Huh? And it was just sort of this. So the last 10 years have really been a real transformation for me and kind of full circle, I think too, with my own work and doing my own therapy, but then also, um, I guess like seeing how I can help other people work through their trauma is, has just been amazing. And then the last mm. year I've really gotten into parenting because um, mm. I became a parent, but I'm um, helping parents basically not traumatize their kids yeah. and trying to equip parents um, with the preventative tools so that I don't have to see their kids to process their trauma um, in adolescence or later in life. Because I, the mm. more I do this work, the more I realize how much of it is preventative and starts little. And if you can, just the way that you speak to your children or whatever, if you start that when they're young, you can change god so much like mm. self-limiting beliefs trauma like just all sorts of things you have the power to change if you kind of get in there young so mm. yeah so i've worked with individuals families couples 
um, little ones. My youngest client I ever had was four. And then, wow. yeah, my, my um, current youngest is 11 and my oldest is 62. So I work across the lifespan. And, yeah. Because um, trauma doesn't discriminate. It's true. <laughs> it, it comes for all of us. So yes. um, Very liberal. Yeah. <laughs> Very liberal, very generous, very <laughs> yeah. generous, very generous. Uh, I know it, it's one of the most um, liberating aspects. I think when you start to learn about the mind, like you, you just get this like level of inclusivity, you know, when you start to understand it more and you just feel like you're just a part of everyone else in the way we respond. Yeah. I'm actually, I wanted to yeah. go back to um, prison though. Like what, what kind of motivated you to work in the prison environment? I did. So I did my bachelor's in criminal justice because I thought I wanted to go into law. And I yep. had spent my first few years um, in college. Well, in America, we call uni college in college and in and high school working at a law firm. And that's when I sort of got into that. And so that's when I got into law and then thinking I wanted to become a lawyer or maybe FBI or CIA, or I thought I wanted to do something forensic-y, like mm. so a little bit of psych, but more forensic. And then I had a professor at uni who, um, what is his name? McElwain, Professor McElwain. He was fast. You know, you have those some professors that like actually make going to school enjoyable. Like oh, you yeah. actually want to learn few and far from between. them. <laughs> Very few and far between, but he was awesome. And Mr. McElwain, this is at um, San Diego State University. And <clears throat> he had just some really interesting courses on drugs and um, the court system and the judicial system. So then that got me thinking about going into kind of government stuff. Mm. And then I also had another professor, Professor Sutton, who did a prison tour. Like, what does that even mean? Yeah. But when I saw it advertised, I was like, what is a prison tour? Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> book. So from the like, oh my God, from the, when did he start doing it? Maybe in the 80s he started doing it. So I graduated uni 2002. So this is like, and yeah, 2000, 2001, he would take groups of students, like 20 students on a bus all throughout California. And he had developed relationships with wardens at each of the prisons Wow! to let the students in. We would walk through the freaking yard, like with inmates, like if they wanted to have killed all of us, they totally had wow. the chance through the yard and then we would go through the corridors and through the cells and they would let us like in one of them i think it was actually in san quentin they opened oh. up the door and let us in and then shut it just for us to have a, a 10 minute experience <clears throat> excuse me a 10 minute experience of the door shutting and feeling how small it was like so small you can't even lay you know i'm 5 10 and i couldn't even lay like that the width of it do you know what i mean like it's yeah. that small Jeez. it has it's just claustrophobic anyway um and so it was in that experience so we went to i think it was eight or ten i think it was ten the ten largest prisons in california so Folsom, sacramento san quentin um all of the kind of the high profile cases and stuff that we've had um, got to meet a couple of those high profile inmates and stuff. Oh. And every night at every prison, we had a, a like round table discussion and we would sit, I shit you not student inmate, student inmate. So you had an inmate on either side. They were obviously vetted a little bit before, but they all had, you know, were in there for life and for murder and rape and, you know, crazy, crazy shit. And it was in that experience of sitting in, and when do you little white girl from LA, like when do I get the opportunity totally. to sit with those kind of people? Right. Yeah. So to, it with those people i then realized oh my god we're all the same yeah we just had different experiences and different parents and different things that your path then went this way and mine mm. went this way but really we're all the same and so it was in that experience and doing so mr McElwain kind of got me thinking into drugs and it changed my whole perception of drugs and legalization and, and marijuana and changed all of that and then Sutton by taking us into all of the prisons and having like just insane access like it's so dangerous and like amazing that he is able to get away with it but I am not joking the prison tour was a week long I learned more in that week than four freaking years of undergrad education which is wow. no surprise like we all know that like practical experience you learn a shitload more but um and in that time of talking to the guys the inmates is when I realized one you're not that scary mm. 
um, if I treat you with respect and treat you like a human being and don't think I'm better than you because of which side of the bars we're on, um, it can be a really, like, I just, I learned a lot from the guys. And so that's kind of when I realized as well, I think that I wanted to help people and that I wanted to, um, I just, I think I initially went into it really gung ho, like I can save them and I can help them. And then when I started working in prison, I was like, oh my God, like there's so much ingrained ways of thinking and thought patterns that are so um just per like i was gonna say permanent not permanent but just so fixed yeah <clears throat> that it just sort of i started to go it's too late once they're already incarcerated or in that system it's you can still you can help a lot of people and a lot of people want to be helped but like when i was working in um, juvenile justice i would have 12 and 13 year olds that had kids of their own and <sighs> both their parents both their parents were incarcerated and so it was just like, how do I help this 13 year old? Like just all the, everything is stacked against you and they're already mm. locked up, you know? So, yeah. Well, I, I think, good. yeah, I, I, you hit so many interesting points. Um, and I think what, you know, one of the unfortunate things about working in therapy is that, you know, our, our role is entirely predicated on individual development because, you know, mm. to the degree that we're only working one-on-one, -on -one, but then you, you move into a system like that. And you, you mentioned before, like the level of incarceration, maximum security, mm. just adding mm. fuel to the shame and the pain. Yes. It's like yes. you go in there and like you want to help everyone, but there's a real systematic issue going on in the judicial yes. system there. Yes. And um, yes. it's, it's, it's tough. I, I think um, it was interesting when you were talking before about, you know, loving, you know, f forensics and all that sort of stuff. Mm. I couldn't help but kind of, psychoanalyze and think that like if you become really <laughs> interested in trauma that that idea behind like trying to get to the root cause and being very yes. forensic in that area yes it, it kind yes. of works really well i was wondering yeah. if you could talk to people now about trauma because there are so many um perhaps you know misconceptions of things people seem to think that there's a more there's an entirely objective standpoint when it comes to what trauma yeah. is. but yeah if you have yeah. a definition or kind yeah. of your experience with it yeah, yeah. sure sure um, it's a good question and it's one that I would love to just educate everyone in the public about because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about it. So the first thing I would think most people think of when they hear the word trauma is they think that means um, someone tried to kill me. Like a trauma is a situation where my life is threatened or I feel like I'm going to die. And for sure, that's traumatic. But that's not what trauma usually looks like. Trauma usually looks like my favorite definition is... Um, Peter Levine, who's one of the like gods and gurus in um, trauma work, is um, his definition, which is trauma is any situation where you feel profoundly helpless or lose your ability to cope. Mm. And when you use that as your definition, and that is sort of the lens through which I see the world and through which I see all of my clients is through a trauma lens. And every clinician has different lenses that, you know, modalities that they subscribe to that they believe that, that that's mine. The trauma lens then makes me sort of look for where in my life, your life, so whoever I'm sitting opposite, is there a sensation or a feeling of helplessness mm. and that I couldn't, my hands were tied, I didn't know what to do, I felt stuck, I felt trapped, I felt powerless. Um, and then you can have the, ability, the inability to cope. And then sometimes you, you can, and you can cope through it, or you just sort of robotically go through the motions. But most of the time we lose our ability to cope. And so when you think about something like um, your mom's cancer diagnosis, um, mm -hmm. losing a job, um, there's just like things that you don't normally, you wouldn't normally say, oh, when my mom had cancer, that was traumatizing. Or when um, the plane had a lot of turbulence and I thought it was going down. You don't, you you don't normally attribute the word trauma to that. And a lot of times I think people hear the word trauma and they're like, Oh, that's for the big shit. That's yeah. for like assaulted in an alleyway, you know, yes. like rape and you know, m you were mugged and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> yes. But the, but so what I always say is like, take that and what you would assume someone would feel from being raped in an alleyway or whatever, and apply that to, how they're feeling about their parent getting cancer or themselves losing their job. Mm. And you'll see the same shit, which is fixated thinking, 
where you just think about the problem or think about the situation, flashbacks, running it over and over and over and over in your head, that trapped, suffocating feeling that you can almost feel physically of, I can't help you know, my mom, I can't help myself financially because I just lost my job. Mm. The same feelings come up physically, physiologically, and mentally and emotionally in all of those situations, even though if I said to you, oh, dude, I'm deeply traumatized by my mom's cancer diagnosis, most people would be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. Like, she feels sorry for her. Like, she's the one who's in the trauma, not you. Mm. And we dismiss and we do this comparative suffering bullshit where we minimize yes. our experience and we make it the fucking pain Olympics where it's like, oh, no, yeah. you get the gold. You get the gold because you have it worse than I do. <laughs> Most but traumatized. Like, <laughs> Exactly. Like, yay. Yeah, well done. Congratulations. Like, who, you worked hard. <laughs> exactly. Who wants to win that? I mean, some yeah. people do have that pathology where they, they do enjoy that, but that's a whole nother like, segment. But it's another anyway, part so of trauma. <laughs> that's, that is another part of trauma. And some people really identify with it. But most of the time, whenever I encounter someone in like our first or second session, then they start telling me about stuff from their childhood or last year or whatever. I'm just like, Bing, bing, bing. Mm. I just see like trauma, 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 trauma. And then I might say something like, it sounds like that, um, that experience was pretty traumatizing. And they're like, and I get this face. Like, yeah. I wasn't assaulted. I wasn't tortured. I'm not a POW. What are you talking about? That's a bit, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's a bit of a heavy word there. <laughs> and I'll explain profoundly helpless and lose the ability to cope. And then they're like, oh, well, if that's the definition, then yeah. Mm. It's such an important way of looking at it because people can start to make the distinction between uh, a scary event um, and then a scary event that has had a lasting effect. Yes. Yes. And the lasting effect is, I guess, the difference because you can have people that experience trauma that is textbook trauma, right? But then they're not traumatized. Mm. And then we look at that and go, that's fascinating. And I've had this, mm. like I've had clients who have lost parents in horrific ways or lost children in horrific ways or <clears throat> been through a really scary situation or a scary event and they're not traumatized. And it's just like, how did you get through that and not be traumatized? And it's because they possibly didn't feel helpless in the situation because mm. they might've been activated and and mobilized and able to do things and they didn't lose their ability to cope so it's not necessarily like um you get mugged or you get um um in a car accident and you are definitely traumatized no 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 it doesn't work like that um and that's another misconception i think that a lot of people assume or like some of these people will, will tell stories about their childhood like in a ted talk or something and you're just sitting there going oh my god how they must be so traumatized and then they're not. And mm. it's often because, and this is also, I think why I'm so passionate about informing people of this stuff, because if you know how it works, then you can kind of trauma proof yourself and you can kind of prevent things. So like friends that have their kids going into like a, a medical intervention of like a little thing, they're having some procedure or something done. I'll tell them and coach them through what to do and what not to do so that their child isn't traumatized from it. Cause there's so much prevention that you can do with trauma. Mm. So I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but yes, it can be the difference, I guess, is that the scariness and stuff is sometimes can be relative. So, yeah, and I think it's a really good tangent to go down because mm. um, obviously prevention strategies, because trauma just leaves such a lasting impact when it just, whatever experience just drastically changes your perception of yourself and of the world. Um, yes. You know, one of the things I find so fascinating about trauma is that in the serious cases, like when POWs and things like that is mm -hmm. more, there's this degree that it's not so much that people are afraid by the experience or something. It's that they couldn't believe who they were in that experience. They didn't, yes. they couldn't believe that was who, who they were capable of being, <clears throat> you know? Um, yes. And, um, but I think prevention is such a, um, a really good point to talk about. And I'd love to hear your perspective on this because, um, as you know, I love reading a lot of the mythological stories and the old belief systems to kind of have a look at kind of what they, how they interpreted the world, mm -hmm. you know, that hero's journey, that idea of kind of venturing forth, exposing yourself to the unknown. Do you think, how do you think that plays out in terms of if we are more aware of the 
potential for danger and suffering in the world. Um, how does that play into being able to prevent trauma in our everyday life and things like that? So do you mean if I know, <clears throat> say a bit more about that. So if I mm -hmm. know what, if I know how trauma works, then it will change my sort of course or what, say a bit more about what you mean. Well, it kind of comes into your, your point about, you know, like parenting and individual development. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If we are to the degree that something is traumatizing, I suppose is something that, really we weren't expecting and there's obviously that helplessness which i think is probably the pivotal marker of it but do you yep. like how can we be more prepared um got it yeah so that so that trauma doesn't leave such a lasting impact yeah 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 so one thing i'm always saying to parents too and i keep in mind with my own kids is sometimes you can traumatize someone and you don't even mean to and it's mm -hmm. of course no parent i mean no mentally healthy parent yeah. sets out to traumatize their kid. Um, but there's sometimes things like say, um, having a sensitive child who's just wired that way, that that's like their temperament. That's how they came out. They're just a really sensitive kiddo. And when you show praise or um, joy to their sibling, the sensitive child takes it as I'm not good enough and I'm not okay. And you don't mean to do that at all. Like you're just, telling the other kid, I think you did a good job or whatever, but the mm. sensitive child might interpret that as I'm less than, and I'm not okay. So then they might see me in therapy as an adult and saying, I always felt really unloved by my parents when they showed um, favoritism or whatever to my sibling. Um, and it left me with sort of a helplessness of, I must perform um, to get my parents love and praise because I didn't receive it. Um, just enough as it was. So does that mm -hmm. make sense of how like, so sometimes you can traumatize your kids and you don't even mean to, um, but that, so that's just one thing to hold in mind mm. that I guess it's less about like protecting and shielding our kids from trauma in general, because it's going to happen because life is full of pain and suffering. And it's, it's not about like, I'm going to put them in, you know, cotton wool and put them in a box in a bubble and they'll be safe forever. That's just not going to happen. So that's why I say the whole prevention thing. So what prevention really looks like is the first place that I always start with kids is when parents is to teach them body awareness. So a lot of times kids don't know how things feel in their body when they feel sad or angry mm. or just on alert. So like if you and I were to get on a train and we were to sit next to someone who was a little bit possibly intoxicated or a little bit aggressive or just something, right? We would have a knowing, right, from life experience, but we'd also have a felt sense. We would have sensations in our body alerting us that this person was slightly dangerous and a little bit unsafe. And we would know by maybe our heart rate would go up or like, you know how when you're about to like say have a confrontation with someone and you, your heart starts pounding a little bit more, your breathing becomes a bit more rapid. You might feel like you're going to throw up or you feel a bit of like a pit in your stomach. You have all of these, or your head gets hot. You have all these sensations physically that you get that if you can teach children how to develop that awareness into their body and adults as well, mm. you can start to see sort of the the warning signs of the alarm bells of going, I'm not feeling safe. Mm. So then I know my body's kind of going down this path of like, shit could get real and I could, I could be going towards a trauma and Oh, I'm paying attention. I just noticed what my body just did then. I just That's noticed awesome. what my breathing did and it just taught me something. So it gave me feedback. I'm not feeling safe. I'm going to leave the room. Mm. I'm going to switch carriages. I'm going to get off the train. This doesn't feel right. Mm. And teaching our children how to trust, well, first how to identify, but then second, how to trust your feeling in your body and just the, just the awareness. So like That's my great. daughter had, my daughter, oh, thanks. My daughter had um, uh, a bunch of dental work last year. And um, before I would always talk to her about connecting into her body and what she noticed in her body before we went in. And then during getting her to connect into her breathing to just really keep her amygdala calm and to slow her down. And then after we would talk again about the stuff she noticed in her body, um, about what it felt like when she was in there and having to lay and be still and the, um, the gas that they give them to make them really calm and sedate is great in some ways because it helps them do their job and it calms their nervous system, but it's bad in some ways as well because it doesn't, and you know this, it doesn't, it doesn't enable 
the nervous system to discharge the fight, flight, freeze response. Mm. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, the second part then getting into trauma um, is the flight, fight, flight, freeze response. I love, I love the mention of the body. I think that's such an important part. And I think like the more dissociated, and I've found this in my own experience, the mm. more dissociated you are, and people start talking to you about, well, what does that feel like in the body? You know, you just yeah. blast it off in your own head and you're like, what do you mean my body? Like as if what it's- What does that have to do with it? Yeah. <laughs> as if it's in the body, you know, like, what are you talking yeah. about? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm watching my two dogs play at the moment and what they'll often do is they'll, you know, they'll sleep and then one of them will like bite the other one and then they'll go really crazy and all that sort of stuff. But mm-hmm. this, this love of, of understanding trauma and them biting, you know, but not too much is like them- kind of what you were talking about understanding where their body stops and where the other person's other dog begins and what pain feels like and what, and I think your your point about the more, you know, the body, and I'm not trying to put words into your mouth, but Mm. the more, you know, the body, the more, you know, what fear feels like, the more you'll be able to get out of a potentially helpless event. But please talk about that because that's so pivotal. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can um, first just build into your awareness, like, and I do this a lot with clients where I just, they have the story and the talking, which is all cortex, which is all top, you know, analytical thought, rational thinking, blah, blah, blah. And they're telling me the story and then I'll stop them and go, okay, can we just pause the story for a minute? And can you just drop into your body and just tell me what you notice? And it is fascinating. You know, some clients, there's so much resistance and hesitation into going into my body because I think there's a deep unconscious knowing of that's where all my shit is. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of people, whenever I lead them kind literally of- Literally too. <laughs> yeah, literally. Um, when I lead them into going into their body, they're so resistant because it's so unfamiliar. So I would say the earlier you can start, and no age is too young or too old, sorry, to start- connecting in with my body and what does it feel like how do i what sensations do i feel so with kids it's when they're angry saying where do you feel that in your body Mm. where is the anger right now or after if they're too enraged after where did you notice the anger was when you were screaming where did you feel the most angry in your tummy or when they feel anxious asking them you know like um my daughter started prep this year and um, one of my kids started prep this year and she felt really nervous and stuff at drop off. And so I would say to her, where do you feel that in your body? And she would say, my tummy, my tummy feels like it's rumbling and um, my throat feels tight and I feel like I'm going to cry. And Mm -hmm. um, so I would just talk her through that and validate and reassure her because the thing that most parents do wrong is, and most of our parents did wrong is they never validated our feelings and our experience in the present moment. They, t- they dismiss it, right? So what I could have said to her, which what I think most parents would say would be something like, um, oh, sweetheart, don't be silly. You know your teacher. You know he's lovely. You have some friends in your class, and it's going to be so much fun. You're going to learn, and it's going to be so blah, 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 blah. But so in doing that, what you're actually teaching the child is don't trust yourself. Mm. Don't trust the feedback your body is giving you that's silly and dumb and ridiculous. So we train them from a really little age to not trust themselves, to doubt themselves. And then we wonder why they have lifelong issues with anxiety and depression and stuff because they've been betraying themselves since they were tiny. Mm, So that's why the, the key of validation is so important with your children, whatever the fuck they tell you. I don't care what it is they're telling you. The, the key is you need to validate how they feel mm. and empathize with them because it doesn't matter if you think what they think is stupid or whatever. It's how they feel. Yes. And how we feel is how we feel. Yes. Yes. It's just, it just is. It's just, I mean, and how many times have you felt a certain way, like not been invited to a party and it's bothered you and you've been then mad at yourself of why does this bother me? I don't even like them, but mm. I can't stop thinking about why wasn't I invited? You feel how you feel. So I think we have to stop trying to tell our kids and our friends and our partners, don't feel that way. That's not okay to feel that way. Or that's silly or you're worrying about something that doesn't matter. Instead, we need to be promoting, encouraging, validating um, how you feel is totally cool. And also it's giving you feedback. So if you're feeling really anxious about something, wow, let's get curious about that. What's that about? Let's, Let's dig into it because... It's often, so the trauma piece or what, how this all relates to trauma is 
if you go into situations constantly blind without looking what is going on how am i feeling what's all the feedback my body is giving me then you have a greater chance of being traumatized mm. if you sorry if you're not doing that if you are doing like body scans where do i notice tension and tightness how am i feeling in this situation what well, that was an interesting thought oh i keep thinking about this where do I notice that? Oh, my shoulders get really tight when I think about that meeting I had yesterday. When yeah. you notice all of that, then you kind of open up to where the trauma could be sitting because mm. trauma is stored in the body, as I know you know, but trauma is stored in the body. And so if you can start by getting the awareness there, then you can start to be more aware when something is starting to feel dramatic. Yeah, it, absolutely. And I think, I think that's a really good point um, to explore because a lot of people listening to this show right now, mm -hmm. um, that's probably the first time they've ever heard that before, that like some kind of okay. experience could be in the body. Like, so yeah, what, what do you mean by that okay. exactly? Um, so a lot of times people think the trauma lives in their brain and in their head because they have, I'm just gonna shut my blinds a little bit because it's giving me light in my eyes. Um, <laughs> They think trauma is in, the is, is in the mind because they have flashbacks or nightmares or they think about a situation repeatedly. And so they think that that's where um, the pain is and the trauma. And I don't want to, don't, don't make me talk about it in therapy because I don't want to think about it. Cause if I have to think about it, it's going to re-traumatize me. Or I'm going to be, you know, in the fetal position on the floor. Yeah. Yes. There is parts of trauma and stuff and that live in the memory and live in the mind. But what we know now from decades and decades of research is that trauma lives in the body. And what that means is that when you experience a traumatic situation, right? So I go into a situation where I start to feel profoundly helpless and lose my ability to cope. The amygdala, which is in the limbic part of the brain or like the lizard part of the brain, the oldest part of the brain, it kicks off this whole fight, flight, freeze response. The amygdala is the, the lovely person we have to thank for that, that response. It's the most primitive response we have, but it's designed to keep us safe, right? So when I go into a situation where I start to feel a little bit afraid, amygdala kind of comes out and is like, <laughs> what's up guys? There's, there's some danger. There's some problem. I'm onto it. You know, and he amygdala goes either we fight, we flight, we run or we freeze. And what that then looks like is amygdala then says to all of the um, hormones, I need some cortisol stress hormone. And I need some adrenaline to pump through all the muscles and all the nerves to help me get ready to fight or to run. The problem is when you get into a traumatic situation, all of that shit happens. Amygdala goes, ah, cortisol, adrenaline, cortisol, adrenaline. And all that cortisol and adrenaline goes through your body. And then it goes through your body because we're not fighting tigers anymore. So usually the traumas that we experience in the modern world are job loss. I don't know, a pandemic say, yeah. uh, things Very like poignant. that. Yeah. <laughs> Things like that, where we are feeling threatened and unsafe because change is all around us, even mm. moving house. Like you might have decided willingly, happily to move house, but that can be really stressful, right? We all know that. Mm -hmm. it's really stressful. But a huge part of why it's stressful is because it's change. Mm. Amygdala hates change, even if it's good for you. Even if it's, hey, let's get up tomorrow morning and do yoga. Amygdala is like, I don't think so because yeah. it's change. It's different. So I'm going to kick, you know, I'm going to dig my heels in and I'm going to kick up a fuss because anytime that there's change, I don't like it. Why? Change could be threat. Mm. Change is different. Change is a different to my, different to my routine. And I like my routine and I like how things are because then I can predict where the lions are, where the bombs are, where the, you know, waterfall, anything remotely mm -hmm. dangerous. I know where it is. So the trauma sort of stays trapped in the body and in the, like the tissue, I guess you could say. And also um, we know this is true because when you work through trauma with people, you often see them complete the cycle. So for example, if in the, if in the trauma they say were attacked and pinned down, when I'm doing a session with someone where either with EMDR, which we can talk about in a minute, either in EMDR <laughs> or in um, talking, they might say things like, like, let's say they were held down and their wrists were held like that, right? They might say, as we're talking, things like, my wrists are feeling really sore. And 
every time it like gets, gives me goosebumps every time that happens. I'm just like, Oh my God, the body is so crazy. I mean, I could be talking to someone who experienced, um, and uh, I've had this, uh, an assault like 30 or 40 years ago, I think it was. And in the talking of the processing, the trauma, talking about it, she was saying, I can feel it in my wrists. I can feel like a heat and a tension and like a, a, a pressing on my wrists. And, um, and so then the next sort of um, way that you work with it is by saying, what do you want to do now? What do you feel like you want to do? And this is in sort of a very calm, visualizing, meditative sort of state. And she said, um, I want to hit. Okay, hit. Because in, in, in her assault, that didn't happen. She wasn't allowed to do that. <clears throat> The body wants to complete the cycle. It wants mm. to, it want the body wants to heal. The body wants to recover. It just doesn't know how. And it often gets stuck in a, in a situation of trauma where your arms are held. So I said, okay, let's hit. So she's sitting there, you know, punching like this and hitting and basically discharging the activation, the, the action that she wanted to do when that happened and she couldn't. And the brain, as beautiful and complex and phenomenal as it is, is also really basic. Yeah. And it can't tell the difference between imagination and real life. You know, you see this, the stats of runners who, you know, run the race in their mind and then they run it in the, st and the um, you know, runners that do a lot of visualization before a race often do way better than runners who don't. Mm. And so you can do these amazing exercises where you basically just rewrite the story to be the story that you wanted. And then also when you, when you, when you um, incorporate the body to then do the action that I wanted to do or say the things I wanted to say, get off me. And then punching, it discharges. So the brain thinks we just did it. I just got away. I fought him off and I'm free and I'm safe. Mm. And then it gets amygdala kind of to calm down and go, it's over. Because the problem with trauma is the amygdala keeps going. It's happening. It's happening. Is it going to happen again? And it's just in this constant stage of hypervigilance. But when you can get the trauma out and kind of rewrite the story, then amygdala can kind of sit back and just relax and not be so on guard. So that's what it means mm. when you say trauma is stored in the body. And dude, so many EMDR sessions I've had, where parts of the body hurt that are connected to the trauma. One woman, um, car accident, car rolled, felt pressure on her chest. And she went like this in the, you can't see all the way, but like a diagonal movement. She's like, I have just really strong pressure in my chest. And then after we worked out, it was the seatbelt that was pressing on her as she was rolling. And that, and it's, oh. it is absolutely amazing. Um, I think if I hadn't, done EMDR. I would think it sounds a bit batshit crazy. But the thing is, they, they started it in the late 80s. So we have like, you know, almost 40 years of data on it now. And, and it's such a consistent story that people have these physical yeah. responses. Um, I had one client who we were doing EMDR. Um, she shoplifted in high school. And it was a deeply shameful experience because the police were involved. And she just stole a pair of socks. But like, it was a very traumatizing experience of how her parents reacted and how much trouble she got in and stuff. Wow. And um, in the EMDR session, we we're sitting there like this and she has her hands, you know, in front of her. And then at one point during the EMDR, she put one hand behind her back. And I said to her then afterwards, and I wrote it down in my notes for that set that, you know, right hand behind her back. And I said to her, and it was when she was retelling the story of, of the shoplifting. And then I asked her at the end, what hand was it? that you use to steal the socks. And she said, my right hand, cause I'm right-handed. Oh man! And I was like, that's so interesting. Oh, because that's crazy. <laughs> she just knew to hide, you know, even as we were redoing it. So crazy. It, yeah. It's just insane. It, it draws so many parallels between uh, what psychedelic research is exploring and, mm. you know, with all these incredible things coming out there. Um, mm. You know, I think one of the craziest ones you told me, I'm well, having a, a, a coffee mm. and um, you know, you said that uh, uh, one of your clients right hand went up when she was, when she drowning. She drowning. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. it, um, what, I think what's so cool about being trauma informed. And I think this is why you and I obviously agree that every single human being in the world should be trauma informed is because yes. 
it implicitly validates everyone's experience. Like what, when you start to realize what the body actually does, you just get yes. this incredible feeling of liberation knowing that it's not yes. only you. It's not, yes. I'm so shit because I keep going back to the same kind of person. It's not good for me. It's like yes. you've got that stored in your body, you know? Yes. Yes. And also things like um, medical conditions make so much more sense when you're trauma informed. I have never met a client who had chronic fatigue syndrome any sort of chronic back pain or chronic pain in general, um, lots of gut issues, um, either IBS or other bowel kind of inflammation issues that does not have trauma in their past. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's because trauma is stored in the body. And so that cortisol and adrenaline is not designed to stay in the body. It's mm -hmm. designed to activate and mobilize and get shit done. And, when we're in trauma, because we're helpless and powerless and we can't do the thing, it then just stays floating around. And so that's why so many people have chronic pain or chronic fatigue and stuff is it actually comes back to something. And it frustrates me beyond words when I hear people saying that they have chronic fatigue or something like that and they're not in therapy. Mm -hmm. And then what bothers me even more is when they're seeing a clinician who only does CBT. And I'm just like, oh my God, this isn't about thought. This isn't about just the way your mindset or like just the way that you're thinking. Like this is body, this is physiological, a physiological response. And so many things from bipolar to borderline personality disorder, so many things that are in the DSM are trauma responses. Mm. It's OCD. Not, Yes, it, it is not just a, oh, we flipped through the book and then boop, you get this one and you get that one. And it's like, this is the sticker that we put on your head. This is the label you get. It's a trauma response, dude. It's a trauma response and it's mm. normal. And that's the thing. When you look at people who have anxiety, severe anxiety, they often, you know, beat themselves up and, and friends and family, you know, are hard on them for why is this bother you? And this is so stupid and this is so silly or whatever. But it makes total sense sometimes for people to have anxiety. It's your body saying, it's your amygdala saying, I don't, I don't feel okay about this. This doesn't feel right. Mm. And we dismiss it and we should be listening and, and leaning in to what the, the feedback is that the body is saying or the thoughts that we're having or whatever. But so often people are trained how you think is wrong. Anxiety is bad. OCD is bad. You're weird. You're fucked up. There's something wrong with you. Mm. It's just trauma response. Yeah. And, and your, your point is so, oh God, it, it, and it's even right from a neuroscientific standpoint, you know, what you're talking mm -hmm. about of like, if you're just doing CBT work, you're only talking to one part of the brain, but everything you're saying is from the other part of the brain. That's where exactly. all the shit is. And that's the part exactly. that you've got to get out. Um, exactly. And that's what you have to connect because what trauma does is it makes a disconnect. Mm. So the, the, the cable that runs from here to here, kind of gets in it or like uh, like a numbing ice block kind of goes in between and then they stop connecting as much. And that's a common thing I hear from trauma clients is I feel numb in my body. Or when I say to them, and where do you notice that in your body? They'll say nowhere. I don't feel anything. So we have to start really basic of just getting, getting that cable to thaw that it can, the two can talk to each other. Cause, mm. and it's often again, adaptive response. If I'm being assaulted or abused, that's brilliant to like, let's disconnect that shit right now yeah. so that the next time I'm abused, I don't have to really feel it. So and I'm going to cut off all my memory to it so that I don't have to think about it again. And so when you hear people say, I don't have many memories of my childhood, I'm like, ding, 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 ding. what is that about? What is that about? Yes. I don't remember anything until 12, you know, everything from zero to 12, I don't remember. And I'm just like, Hmm, what Let's was go. going on there? <laughs> the forensic is coming out. <laughs> yeah. What was going on there? Because there's a reason why your brain went, la, 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 la. I'm not going to remember this shit, you know? Mm, and often absolutely. Yeah. When did EMDR come into this Heidi? So because, because EMDR, mm. I don't think is, I mean, it's, I don't think it's super well known. It's becoming more well, it changed my fucking life. That's for sure. Mm. You changed my life with yeah. it. Um, that's why awesome. I wanted to get you on the show. But wh when yeah. did you start to become more interested in EMDR? I heard about it probably 10 years ago and thought it sounded crazy. Like it just sounded like woo woo. It just sounded yeah. dumb. I just thought like, 
I mean, hypnosis, I think is cool and has its place, but I just sort of think like if hypnosis, cause that's been around forever. I thought, well, if hypnosis is a game changer, then why isn't everyone doing it? And mm. why don't you hear everyone saying hypnosis changed my life or whatever. And you'd hear stories of, I tried it for smoking and it worked and then it stopped or whatever. So I just sort of thought it was like hypnosis because you get in a sort of hypnotic state. And then when I learned that you, someone's wagging their fingers, I was like, (laughs) (laughs) that's just crazy. Like that's just nuts. And oftentimes when I'm trying to convince a client that I think EMDR would really help them, I say to, I I can't do it in like the first session because I know they'll leave and they'll never come back because I think it just sounds so wacky. Yeah. But I often have to wait till we have more of a relationship and we're more kind of, you trust me more to then do it because I think I have to kind of woo you or like win you over to do it because it just sounds so nuts. So yeah, so I got into it. Um, so 10 years ago is when I first learned about it because that's when I started working in trauma. And so I started hearing it so much and was just like, what is this? And neurofeedback was the other thing I started uh, yes. um, hearing a lot about. And I actually got certified and trained in neurofeedback, but I haven't bought the equipment and done it, but that's a whole nother thing. But yeah, mm. neurofeedback is amazing. But um, yeah, so I started hearing about it. And then when I kind of all my colleagues, all my friends who I worked with in sexual abuse, um, and especially ones that worked with um, vets and um, uh, POWs and stuff like that, I was like hearing some of their results and was just going like, what? Like, it just, it sounds too good to be true. Mm. Curing it trauma kind- is insane. Totally. And mm. in it like an hour and a half, like yeah. what? Like it just sounds nuts. But then if you think about you know, like if I told you, Hey, if I cut off half of your liver, it's going to regenerate. Or if I cut your arm, your skin is going to grow back and it's, your body's going to heal itself. You're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Mm, that's a good point. Brain's no different. Brain's an organ. You know, it, it wants to heal. It's trying to heal. And EMDR is kind of that catalyst. And so that's, yeah, that's when I got into it and then did the training and then started using it. And I will never go back. Like it's just, it's such a vital like tool in my arsenal of working with trauma because it's so fast. Like that's the craziest part about it. It's so minimally painful. Like it's so not that hard because it's just, I basically say to clients, like it's just an hour and a half. That's a little bit rough, but, um, and you might cry and stuff, but it's really not like excruciating yeah, compared and, to like, you know, other stuff. Well, and it's, it's also, yeah, you're right. It, it's psychologically non-invasive, you know, like, yeah. you know, the psychedelic world is getting a really big pump up at the moment, but you do mm. feel, and I, I haven't done it with, you know, the clinical approach and, you know, proper set and setting. I just jumped in there and traumatized myself, <laughs> but <laughs> It's just when it's your own body and you're there, someone who's informed mm. and is, you know, you've got that quote, quote, safe space. Um, yeah. You just feel like you can kind of explore those depths um, a little bit more. But you're exactly right. Like, you know, after, unless that rapport is built, you know, saying to someone, now I'm going to wave my arm around and uh, <laughs> I'm going to get rid of all your problems in an hour and a half. Sound good? You'd be like, sure. <laughs> Have my house. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know my my favorite thing that I always find with EMDR is at the beginning, you know, we do the scale of like zero to 10 and you have the one scale is um, when I think about this memory, how distressing is it? And picking the like gnarliest part of the whole thing. And so um, people will always start with a 10 out of 10, like cause mm. we're doing trauma. So this was a really horrible situation thing that happened to me. And then when I tell them, and when you leave here, you'll be at a zero or a one. They're like, that's cute. Yeah. Like, that's sweet. I've been carrying this trauma for 40 years. I think that's a load of shit. Yes. And I can I'm afford like, you. <laughs> Come yeah. on. And I'm like, trust me, trust me. And then every single time I've, I've yet to have someone where it doesn't work. Mm. So yeah. And you get them to the point where they feel zero distress of the most horrific experience of their life you get them to say, I feel zero out of 10 or one out of 10 distress when I think about that moment. Whereas previously it was, you know, 11, it was 10 out of 10. It's crazy. And it's an hour and a half. It's just wild. And so basically the way that I explain it to people is when you start EMDR, the memory, the sensations, the fear, the terror is right here and it's right in front of you. And in like every set, 
it just sort of pulls it further and further away. And so then what happens is that horrible thing is like over here. I can still see it. It's not like you forget about it, but it's so far away from me now. I can actually look at it. And then that enables you to do the therapy mm -hmm. because you can see it and you can like look at it and you can like pick it up and go like, oh, that's what happened. And you're not so like, oh my God, don't touch it. This is, this is horrifying. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. I can't even look. I can't even look. I can't even look. So EMDR just creates this like beautiful space and distance. And what so many people say is um, the memory feels fuzzy now. It just feels really kind of far and over there. And I'm like, yes, that's exactly what we want. We don't want it to be so vivid and like, <gasps> like it's happening right now, you know? Yeah. I certainly felt like the, the waving of the hand gave my, you know, orienting reflex something to focus on in the present yeah. so that I could go back into the memory. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the whole point. It taxes what's called your working memory. Mm. So it makes you by watching my fingers back and forth, it gives you a, an anchor in today. Yep. So then brain goes, well, I'm in this room with Heidi in Australia. So I can't be back also in that childhood memory or the car accident or the assault or whatever, because I know, cause I'm looking at this. So then it gets this sort of push pull in the brain where it's like, but then I'm kind of going back there in my head, but then I'm physically here with you now. And then, and that's the beautiful way of how you stay safe mm. because brain has this anchor point of sitting with me and going, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. Cause I'm with you. Mm. So I can go kind of back there in my mind just a little. And that's, what's so nice is we don't, you're not closing your eyes and like really submerging yourself into the painful memory. You're just sort of looking at it on the surface. Look, and you know, that, that I think what you just said then has to be probably the most important um, thing that you have said, especially for therapists, because there are a few that mm. listen to this show and oh, cool. the, the fundamental difference between AMDR and just blatant exposure therapy is that the latter just ends up mm. re traumatizing the individual. You know, yes. it's just like, we're going to go back into the memory. It's like, well, you haven't yeah. shut off all the shit yet. Yeah, totally. Totally. And it, I think to get someone to do exposure therapy or immersion, um, good luck with that because mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to do it. Like who would want to do that? Like, totally. no thanks. And it's not even guaranteed that it works really. Whereas EMDR, I know that's not necessarily guaranteed, but, um, I think the stats are a hell of a lot better with EMDR and also it's the clinician like with anything are, there's good dentists and bad dentists and you know bad plastic surgeons and good ones like you can't just say all plastic surgery is bad or dentistry is bad or EMDR is bad a lot of it has to do with the clinician so pick someone who you know because you have a friend who did it and they had a great experience or whatever it's not one size fits all with anything in life but Jesus, mm. especially therapy. It's not one size fits all. You can't just go see the first person you, you know, discover <laughs> in Google. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, to your credit, I think this is why it, it's, you're so good is because you, you build such an incredible rapport, at least in my experience, it could be useless to everyone else. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but in my experience, it was just so good to feel so safe with you so that I could go back into that experience and feel like I wasn't going to have to relive it, you know? Um, yeah. What do you want to share about your, I'm just curious, what do you oh, yeah. want to share about your EMDR experience of what, cause you know, you've done it. So maybe is there an opportunity to share with people, I guess, who might be afraid to do it? Um, the, yeah, it's not the most comfortable hour and a half of your life, but the, the relief or the joy or like the what maybe you can sell it on the what you got afterwards of how well, it shifted you or how it changed how did it change you what what shifted for you well i wrote about it entirely oh, so did i you? And, yeah i'll send it i'll send it to you okay. as a blog because it's in the book cool. that i'm writing but um oh, cool. um you know i've got no issue sharing it but i think what it did was that it integrated the experience from my childhood into the narrative of my life it it it, mm -hmm. it led to the um connection of kind of like this lost part of the self that was like, Oh, that's a part of me too, you know, but essentially, yeah, no, you know, we connected cause I um, reached out to you and I wanted to help with this. It's this really kind of shameful experience that happened to me. And I was, when I was younger and it ended up being, cause there's so much emotion around the experience, you know, yeah. when you do this EMD work and, and I'll get into it, you start to see how, it wasn't just, oh, I'm a bad person because I'm a loser and I reacted like that. It's more like the circumstances external to myself were such that 
most people in that environment would have reacted the same way. And I think having the safety to go back into that experience. And like I said before, when I'm just watching your hand, there's a kind of like Mm. hypnotic idea about that, but knowing you, trusting you, we'd already spoken about the experience Mm. and feeling comfortable to go back into the memory. Mm. I could go there and I could actually start to notice the peripheral of the memory. So I was Mm. starting to, it wasn't because I felt so safe and I felt like I could focus on something in the present, like you said, what my mind started to do, and this isn't just me because I'd read books, you know, this was like, I'm just in this experience as an ignorant bystander. I started to notice what actually was going on around the memory as opposed to just my interpretation of it, which is so strange because I didn't know I had access to those parts of the memory, but I started to notice how other people what they were doing, at least insofar as yes. I remembered and what my yes. friend's mum, how she was looking and then yes. you know, kind of what he was doing and yes. all these other weird things and parts of the memory that I didn't even realise were traumatic in themselves. And then mm. I felt like I was in a dream. And, you know, I told you that when I got really angry and I, like after I'd cried and I felt the depression, I was punching the shit out of that pillow. I noticed mm-hmm. myself growing into like a 30 foot giant and seeing her and seeing him be like, I'm way better than you and moving all the, through those emotions Yeah, and just coming into this incredible awareness after like 90 minutes and be like, wow, there's so much of that memory that my fear didn't show me. And that it actually, the fear wasn't right. Although it was just trying to protect me, it didn't really get the objective scenario, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I honestly couldn't recommend EMD, EMDR more, you know, and I tried um, and, I, and with you too, mm-hmm. but it was the, uh, you know, the psychology and exposure therapy and psychedelics, so mushrooms mm-hmm. and MDMA and meditation and journaling, mm-hmm. journaling I fucking love, but yeah. that just, quick yeah you know um Mm. it's not comfortable yeah (laughs) worth it yeah and that's what i always say to people is that it's just it's a rough 90 minutes and Mm. if it's and really not even because like it's really only a few sets you know it's only a few and so if each set is like 30 to 60 seconds we're talking like minutes then that you just kind of got to go there And we just sort of dip in and dip out and dip in and dip out. And it's so tolerable Mm. that if you think, holy shit, this experience is going to give me freedom from my nightmares. You know, like I had a girl um, that I saw last uh, September who has horrifically violent, aggressive, horrible nightmares for four to five nights a week. And, and has, she's 19 and she has since she was about 10. And um, yeah. And just the sleep deprivation that she experiences and then the anxiety that comes with just being so tired all the time. And anyway, we did EMDR and I think it was two nights after the EMDR, the nightmare stopped. (laughs) She hasn't had a nightmare since. And then actually when um, coronavirus stuff started to come, she had her first nightmare um, since September, since the EMDR. And um, yeah, and her session, her EMDR was obviously hard it was a Mm -hmm. it was a rough Mm -hmm. 90 minutes but same thing it was only this a few sets where it was you know crying and and upset and everything else around that is pretty tolerable and then you just have a couple sets so it's we're talking like i don't know two minutes of just intense pain and like not physical pain but crying and then you kind of whoop you're out of it and then your brain just starts to do its thing and just starts to heal and so for her and for so many people are you kidding me i have to spend a couple minutes crying and then i have a lifetime of freedom from mm. the flashbacks, the nightmares, the self-limiting beliefs that come with the experience, all of that. It's like, dude, it's so worth it. It's oh, so worth it. It's, it's so, so true. And, and I even take it one step further, you know, and I, I, we, we spoke over the phone about mm. my dreams that night, you know, yes. um, which was yeah. so cool. And I just feel so like cool. there's a, it's probably like the psychoanalyst in me, but there's just such a romantic approach to, alchemizing pain into meaning you know i just yes. feel like that when you move through the like as you say there is a bit of pain and discomfort when you move through an EMDR session but it's kind of mm-hmm. like you look back on that it's just one of the most meaningful experiences of your, of your life it fundamentally changes the way you see yourself and yes. i think you can't you know to kind of round this back we started the, the podcast by talking about 
the inevitability of trauma and about pain and suffering in life. But obviously yes. the opposite of that is everything that we're trying to chase. You know, we want more yes. meaning, we want more purpose, want to feel more connected. And yes. unfortunately you can't have one without the other, but they both make each other. Yeah, totally. And I think it's a, a interesting conversation to trauma, EMDR, all of this around our relationship with pain in general, because yeah we're kind of trained. I think culture says pain is bad. Um, take medication, drink, drug, sex, Netflix, everything to just sort of numb and avoid my pain because pain is too much. It's too hard. I don't want to go there. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to go to therapy, open that can of worms because it's just going to be pain and I don't want to touch my pain. And what you realize though, is I think once you come out the other side and once you've process some of your pain and done some therapy that you realize I actually don't need to be afraid of my my pain and I don't need to and we don't need to be afraid for our children mm. and the pain that they're going to experience because when you say to yourself I'm afraid of pain I don't want to feel pain I don't want to feel pain the the like self-limiting belief I think that goes with that is I can't handle it mm. bullshit yes you can People have been handling stuff for thousands of years. That is ridiculous. I mean, you hear stories of just horrendous things and mm. people get through it and they can make meaning from it or they can use it to help other people or change lives or whatever, but it's not a death sentence. Pain isn't the worst thing in the whole world. And so what I am really passionate about is helping people change their relationship with pain mm. because if you are afraid of it, you will never realize how strong you are and you will never realize what you can get through. If you see pain, if pain comes to you and you go, hello, pain, nice to see you. Come and sit down. Let's have some tea. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about this. It's such a better way to live. It's such a nicer way to live rather than mm. being afraid and always running away from pain and hiding and, and the same thing with our children. Oh, shield, shield, protect, protect. Don't you touch my child pain. If you instead turn them towards it and go, you can handle this. Yeah, this is hard. Yeah, this is scary, but I'm right here. You can handle this. Mm. I can see your fear and I can see your courage and your courage is bigger. Because then when they do that and they encounter pain and the same with us, when you encounter pain and you get through it, then you're like, Hey, look at me. Yeah. <laughs> I just got through that. And then you have that like trophy moment to look back on and you have that trophy to say the next time you come to pain, you go, I can get through this. Cause I got through that and I got through that and I got through that. So when you deny mm -hmm. yourself or your children, a painful experience, just because I don't want to feel pain, you're not in, like empowering them that you can do it. You're making them think you can't handle this. And then when it comes to yourself, it's the same thing. So I actually say to people, mm. like, step into your pain, lean in, get closer, find out what it's about, find out what it's here to teach you. Mm. Because what's the alternative? Yeah, a lifetime behind closed doors. <laughs> yeah, and suffering and victimhood. Yes. And if I can look at my pain as a transformative teacher, whatever you want to call it, that's a much nicer place to live in believing mm. everyone and everything is here to, to help me and not hold me back versus everyone and everything is here to hurt me mm. and hold me back. That's not how I want to live my life. That's painful. That's victim. That's blamey. That's scary. That's helpless, powerless. That's a really hard place to live. Mm. If I live on this side in believing that everyone and everything is here to help me and, and not hold me back and to teach me and what can I learn from this experience, that's a much more beautiful way to live and a lot mm. less suffering. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional, you know? Yes. And that, that is the piece of when I encounter pain or the traumas of my life, I try to look at it and go, what is this here to teach me? What can I learn from this? What can I learn from this? And it's not, it's timing. It's not when you're in it that you're like, mm, this is a beautiful blessing. To learn. <laughs> Hit me you again. <laughs> yes. I love it universe. You know, like bash me again, totally. burn my house down again. Like, no, <laughs> it takes time. Like it's a timing thing. You got to get to a space where you're, you're, you want to look inside and see what's the meaning there. We don't, get there on the first day after the tragedy happens it's time but eventually that's where i i try to get is to a place where i can look at the pain and kind of you know 
hold it up and examine it and go, what can I learn from this? How can this teach me? I don't particularly like those options as being, what is this here to teach me? You know, and how is this here to help me? And then how is this here to hurt me and hold me back? But what are our options? I don't know what else our options are. To mm. me, it feels like those are the only two ways that I can view stuff that happens to me mm. and to my kids. And I just go, well, I don't really like the victim thing of going everyone and everything is here to hurt me and hold me back and victim blame powerless helpless um resistance to what is mm. and the saying this should have happened they should have done this like that's just a shit way to feel all the time and yep. disempowered and, hard. and it doesn't feel nice <laughs> and hard like just makes life so much harder <laughs> than it needs to be yeah totally totally so i would rather go on the other side of the fence and and ask what can this teach me and you know same yep. thing with with the pandemic right now um, I have some hours where I'm like, this is amazing. And this is such a great learning experience. And I'm learning so much and I'm growing and meaning making. And, you know, there's so many things I see as blessings in this. And then I have the next hour where I'm like, I fucking hate this. I want my old life back. Like I'm an extrovert. I miss socializing. I miss my friends. Um, I miss getting out of the house. I hate being stuck at home all the time with my kids. So it's like, so I guess what I'm saying is I'm, I'm not saying that I sit on that side of the fence constantly and then it's like everything's just full of meaning and no. I love everything that happens to me you know like my car got hit and I'm like mm, what is the universe trying to teach me <laughs> no you can still be resistant or frustrated to things but I just always say I try to move out of that and the quicker I move out of that and the quicker I go into how, how can this teach me the more peace I feel and the less suffering I feel. Mm, it's yeah, it, it's so, it's so true. I think I, you're exactly right. You only get those two choices. Is it, is it happening to me or is it happening for me? Yes. And although, you know, I think some people that are much less into the woo woo stuff and I think you and I are, and there are people that are yeah. hell a lot more into it, <laughs> Yeah. but yeah. it's not necessarily like an empirical truth. It's not as though we're saying this is legitimately backed by science happening for you but it's a, it's a value truth. It's a, how yes. you look at it. Um, yes. in the same way of saying, um, I think I was having a conversation recently, just like the term malaria means bad air, you know, mosquitoes carry the malaria. Mm. It's not, there's not bad air, but if you don't go to the place with bad air, you're going to be safer. So it's like mm -hmm. a truth, but it's mm -hmm. based on a system of value, um, mm -hmm. which I think really helps us. But there's a, there's a really important question just to wrap this up, Heidi, that like yeah. when people are just starting to get into this kind of work, mm -hmm. um, they want to maybe try something. They don't necessarily feel comfortable to go and speak to someone just yet. Um, mm -hmm. What's like something they can do just to kind of like explore their inner world a little more or perhaps kind of look at the pain? Mm. Um, I like my little three-step thing that I do is um, stop, sink and stay. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do when I have a feeling come up. So my whole thing with trauma is, and for people who are kind of in their babyhood of exploring their trauma, or ex just exploring the mind body connection deeper is to just learn how to feel the feelings. And which sounds, I think quite basic. And it's like, what do you mean? I feel happy. I feel angry. I feel my feelings, but yeah. most of us don't, we just feel it in the cortex. We just feel it in sort of an analytical like thought way of I feel angry. We don't actually drop into the body. So that's a place that I often will tell clients to start is, um, so the first step is stop. So when you start feeling an emotion or a feeling, stop, just pause and just take 10 seconds to just look around and see what sensations am I noticing. I'm feeling really angry. I'm feeling like my fists are starting to clench or whatever, then sink. So that I use in my self because I feel like when I visualize myself up here, I'm thinky and I'm really um, like rational thought, yep. and, you know, analysis, which is great, but doesn't help trauma. And that's why you hear so many people be like, I've been in therapy for 10 years and I still am depressed or I'm still anxious. And it's like, yeah, because you haven't been doing body work. Like you've got to go into your body. <laughs> the best dude. psychologist ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you've got to go into your body. If you're not doing body stuff, you're wasting your time. So yeah. we're not wasting your time, but like it just takes longer. Yes. Um, so, and then sync is S I N K as in drop into your body. And then a client said to me the other day, um, she goes, Oh, when you said sync, I thought S Y N C as in like, I'm sinking. And I was like, let's call it both. Yeah, so cool. 
sinking into your body. So I visualize sort of my head going, dropping down like into my chest, like under the surface of the water and just really connecting into how do I feel right now? So I notice my tummy is tight, my heart is beating, um, my muscles feel tense and just bringing my awareness to my body mm. and noticing what I notice and feeling the feelings. Ah, this is what my anger is feeling like. This is what my frustration is feeling like. And it actually takes, um, Jill Bolte Taylor, who did a great Ted talk on, um, stroke of insight. It's called, she had a stroke and it was fascinating. It's, it's a really popular Ted talk. She talks about how, um, the research shows us that there is 90 seconds that you actually feel a feeling where the hormone is discharged. The thought happens, the hormone is discharged, you know, like the input comes in and then you feel a feeling for 90 seconds wow. that those hormones and things travel through. And then after 90 seconds, whatever you feel is because of the thoughts and the stories you're continuing to tell yourself afterwards. Whoa. So when I go into the sync stage, I just either count to 90 if I have time to just try to feel the feelings for 90 seconds. Because if you want feelings to go away, you have to feel them. Mm. They don't go away just by, and this is a common thing with trauma is people think if I just don't think about it, it'll go away and I don't have to worry about it. And I just box it up. And that's not what the research shows what happens with trauma. What happens is if you need to feel it for it to pass and cycle through. So in, I spend 90 yeah. seconds sinking. I sink my mind and my body together and I sink into my body by feeling the feelings. And then the last one is stay where I just sort of stay kind of compassionately with myself in kind of a parent child dynamic, adult me, little me, I guess you could call it where I kind of just extend compassion to myself for however I'm feeling rather than rejecting, whipping. Why are you feeling upset about this? Why did you just yell at the kids? That's so bad that you just lost your temper or whatever. Yeah. I can go into that whole thing of rejecting my feelings and abandoning myself in the way that I felt in that moment. So I just stay in kind of a like compassionate way with myself of just going, okay, so you felt angry or you lost your temper or you're feeling really sad about that and you know, you're trying to shake it off. That's okay. That's all right. And I just extend that compassion and all of this, when you first start doing it, it takes a little while cause you're clunky. Like anything new, you feel a bit retarded when you start it yeah. and you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and then the more you do it and the more you practice, you get better at it. And so mm. now I can do that quite quickly and I just will stop. Okay. I'm having a real reaction to what that person just said or what they just did or, whatever mm. hmm. sit with it for a second what's what's coming up in my body okay just noticing that okay all right give it some breath and so that's where i would say you could start with trauma um and then another yeah. thing to start with trauma would be um just sort of bringing into your awareness what are some of the thoughts that you have about yourself and where they come from. So you know how with the MDR, there's that sheet of um, positive and negative cognitions. And if anyone who's listening just wants to Google positive and negative cognitions, there's these tons of them, or I could, you can email me and I can send you one, um, that has one column of positive um, beliefs about myself and negative. So the negative zones would be like, I'm not in control, I'm powerless, I'm useless, um, I'm not lovable, I'm not worthy, just whatever. And if you look at that list, you'll see the like top three that kind of jump out at you and go, mm, that resonates, that one hits me. Yeah. And then you ask yourself, where does that come from? Where did I learn that? What experience did I have or who taught me that mm. I'm powerless? And it usually will come back to a trauma. And then when you can identify my self-limiting beliefs, some of my core beliefs that I am not okay or I'm not in control or it's my fault. I didn't do enough or whatever. You then see how much that one self-limiting belief is like threaded all throughout your life that goes back to that one moment. I'm dirty. I'm bad, you know, whatever. And you then look at, oh my God, that, that experience led me to believe this thing about myself mm. for decades. And so if you can see that, then you can start to unpack that. And that's just kind of a beautiful way to start and then see that self-limiting belief is a story you're telling yourself that will pop up again and again and again in all sorts of places. And if you just are aware, ah, that's one of my self-limiting beliefs that I have to perform to be lovable or whatever, then you can just start to have awareness and get sort of off the automatic 
robot thinking and you can see it more objectively and go, that's just a story mm. based on that time on the playground when all the kids ran away from me. That's what that's from. That's wow, that actually- really happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> that was all the monkey of, buzz. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people have a playground story that yeah. informed the rest of their life because I had a client last week who was telling me about uh, like the bully lead girl, you know, tried to get them all to um, abandon and reject one of the girls and she went along with it and she's carried, you know, she's in her thirties. She's carried this trauma and shame from that one experience on the playground of rejecting and feeling so bad about herself. And cause she acted so contrary to who she really is. Yeah herself and betrayed her friend and um yeah it's amazing how many of us have playground stories um of how they've impacted us and and given us a story that i am bad or i am not good or i'm not trustworthy or whatever so you just got to be aware and figure out what they are i think um one of the best things that you ever taught me was the difference between shame and guilt you know and Mm -hmm. the the basic Mm -hmm. premise was essentially that you know, and this, these, these are your words, but, you know, guilt was something that you did was bad. And then shame was mm. because something that you did was bad, you are therefore bad. And I think that's such I an important bad. distinction. I am bad. Yeah. Because it's like, well, the idea there is, is that you've, you know, you've brought that experience along with you for every yes. part of your life now and you don't need yes. to, you don't need to. Yes. hundred um, percent. Which is really good. Yeah. Heidi, um, we could talk for hours and we often do. And yes, this, won't, <laughs> this won't be the first um, podcast for sure. I'd love to have you on um, heaps and yeah. heaps. And I, I think this is a show where people, if this is someone's kind of first introduction to looking at kind of the mind in terms of a, you know, somatic interpretation, um, they should re listen to because there's just so much that you said there that is just so important. And you said it in a really great way as well. Like I think you, you know, you say it in a very practical way, which gives people Mm. an ability to apply it to their lives straight away. So Mm. if this is your first introduction, just press the repeat button. Um, You can put it on 1.5 if you need to. (laughs) (laughs) Just go for it because there's a lot in here. But um, yeah, Heidi, where can people find you? Uh, My website is HeidiRogers.com.au. My Instagram is HeidiRogers underscore. And I'm actually in the process of doing some uh, webinars and courses and building those right now. Yeah. So hoping to try to get, especially given the current situation of social distancing, trying to get more stuff online so that people can kind of start their therapy journey or um, do it kind of in the privacy and comfort of their own home to start to sort of unpack their stuff. So yeah, that's where people can find me. So good. So good. And um, when's all that going to be out anyway? When's the course coming out? probably I reckon in, well, I'm doing webinars a lot. So if people want to do more, um, if they just email me, um, info at Heidi rogers.com.au, yep. they can I'll put get it in the on show my notes. mailing list. Oh, cool. They can get, um, on my mailing list and then be informed when I have a webinar. Like I have a webinar this Thursday on, um, the Wednesday or Thursday. I don't know. Wednesday or Thursday, um, the five habits of resilient families. Mm. So that is, one I have. And then just, I do a lot of webinars on anxiety because I find that that's a common one resilience because that's a common thing people ask me about. And then I'm going to be building ones on trauma. And then also for clinicians, I want to build some webinars to help. Um, I had a colleague say that to me the other day, she's like, there's so much to learn with trauma that I don't know. And I want to learn more. How do I, you know, do kind of a crash course. So I'm going to be doing more webinars, but yeah, the course I reckon, I don't know, two months maybe. I reckon until it's till it's all. But I'll start releasing. I probably will start releasing modules as I do them. So we'll kind of do it together. So like I would release module one, and then in that next week I'm building module two, and then kind of going through it like that. Yeah. Sick. Well, how about we do a show when it's um in t- oh, you know yeah. officially launched? We'll do another one. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Awesome. It. Awesome. Heidi, yeah. my friend, thanks so much for doing that. Yeah pleasure it was really fun and really yeah. fun to um chat to you about this stuff and unpack it and i think the things that you shared too will be really helpful for people to be less afraid of trauma and emdr and stuff so thanks for being open and honest about your experience too uh, absolutely it was it was looking back it was really good fun so yeah it <laughs> very, was. Me- very meaningful stuff yeah <laughs> cool thanks heidi all right dude talk to you soon